A castle keep towers into the sky, resting on massive stone walls. Japan's castles are masterworks of wood and rock. As fortresses, castles bristled with defenses to repel enemy attacks. They also functioned as symbols of authority and ruling power. Today, they are cherished local symbols and popular tourist spots. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is castles, centuries-old showcases of architectural elegance and ingenious fortification. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in the city of Kumamoto in the island of Kyushu, and behind me you'll see Kumamoto Castle. Japan has many castles, but this is said to be one of the most splendid of all. Peter, Dono. Yes. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet both of you. Thank you very much. I'm sure I will have a very good time. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Kumamoto Inquisition? I'm not sure. I think they're a welcoming committee, actually. I was first here in this city and saw this castle, actually, close to 40 years ago. It was my first experience of a Japanese castle, and, of course, they're very different from the European ones. Let's start off today with a look at what Japanese castles are all about. Looming over their surroundings, Japanese castles were fortified military installations with a high keep as a command post, watchtowers for looking out and defending the walls, and moats to repel assaults. Castles also served as centers of government, as well as the living quarters of the castle's lord. In the 16th century, an estimated 30 to 40,000 castles stood in Japan. Let's take a look at a few classic Japanese castles. This is Himeji Castle, famous for its white plastered exterior walls. Rising out of green surroundings, almost like a giant bird taking flight, it earned the nickname White Heron Castle. In 1993, it became Japan's very first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Flanked by modern skyscrapers is Nagoya Castle, constructed in 1609 as a military base that asserted the power of the shogunate. This castle's signature feature is a pair of golden fish-like beasts on the roof, embodying the authority of the castle lord. Matsumoto Castle is surrounded by steep mountains. Its distinctive black walls are constructed of planks over plaster, lacquered for water resistance, an exceptional combination of beauty, functionality, and durability. The main defensive feature is the 60-meter wide moat, above which the black keep rises solemnly. Castles began to spring up across Japan towards the end of the 12th century. The age of the samurai was dawning and conflicts were breaking out in many places. Most of the castles from that era were hilltop fortresses that took advantage of Japan's mountainous terrain. Rivers, cliffs and other natural features were exploited to create formidable defenses. But as more and more areas were pacified, hilltop castles became inconvenient. Their rugged surroundings and lack of usable land prevented retainers and merchants from living nearby. So castles began to be built on plains rather than up in the mountains. The 17th century saw the start of a long period of peace under the Tokugawa shogunate. 
Castles were no longer military strongholds. Now they were centers of political activity. This is Nijo Castle in Kyoto. It lacks a keep, essential for military purposes. Instead, it is centered on a palace. The facility was used by the shogun to receive emissaries of the imperial court. Accordingly, it was gorgeously decorated. The role of Japanese castles has changed with the shifting tide of history. Today, they are popular sightseeing attractions and symbols of civic pride. Mr. Senda, I presume. Oh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I understand you're an archaeologist specializing in castles. Yes, let's explore the subject together. Yoshihiro Senda is the president of Nara University and a true castle specialist. Senda became captivated after being struck by the beauty of Himeji Castle when he was a boy. Since then, he has visited more than 1,300 castles around the world. Along with doing archaeological and preservation work in Japan, he has also traveled to places including Europe and Mongolia to compare their castles with Japan's. This castle is pretty much in the center of the city, and I've noticed with other Japanese castles, so they tend to be central, whereas my memory tells me that certainly in England, uh, castles tend to be on the outskirts or even outside the towns. Is there a reason for that? That's actually an interesting feature of Japanese castles compared to others in the world. Kumamoto Castle is an example of the castles built around Japan in the Edo period, or more precisely from the end of the 16th through the early 17th century. A lot of new cities were planned and built around that time. The location of the castle was set first, and then the town was built around it. That's why a lot of Japanese castles are right in the middle of the cities to this day. Japan has a lot of castles. Um, I don't remember seeing that many either in England when I was still there in my youth or in other European countries, really. There are some, but n nowhere like the number that you see in Japan. Why are there so many castles in this country? That's a very good question. The biggest reason lies in Japan's medieval history in the 14th and 15th century. At that time, the authority of the shoguns and of the emperor became very weak, so samurai across Japan battled for territory. This is known as Japan's Sengoku or Warring States period. This regional conflict went on for about 200 years without a break. The result was that local warlords sprang up in every corner of the country and they built their own castles. I mean, this castle wall alone is absolutely magnificent, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the way it's built, how many years is it going to take to build something like that? It was constructed pretty quickly, very quickly, actually. In fact, it took only about 10 years to build the whole castle. And it wasn't just the military personnel who constructed it. The entire local population got involved in building it. They were mobilized for that purpose. So it was basically a duty, but behind that was the thought that if fighting broke out, the local people could flee into the castle for protection. In a sense, they won that right by participating in the construction. I wouldn't call it forced labor, rather there was a mutual understanding. And I believe that's how this magnificent castle was built. Mm. Kumamoto Castle is one of the most famous in Japan. Kato Kiyomasa, the first lord of the Kumamoto domain, had it built in 1601. Today, it draws 1.6 million tourists per year, ranking it among Japan's most popular castles. On the million square meter grounds, there are various structures, including two keeps in the center. The original keeps were burned down in 1877 during a rebellion, but were reconstructed in 1960. It is now a museum exhibiting armor and weapons. 
It also offers superb views over the city of Kumamoto. In front of the keeps is the Uta Watchtower, often called a third keep. This four centuries old structure was the fulcrum of the castle's defenses, now designated an important cultural property. To the right of the keeps is the Honmaru Palace, rebuilt in 2008. This building was used for administration and as the Lord's living quarters. The sumptuous interior is a faithful recreation of the original. Perhaps the highlight of Kumamoto Castle is its artfully constructed castle walls with their elegant curvature. They remain as impressive a sight now as they were 400 years ago. Wow, look at that. That's really spectacular, isn't it? This is an entirely man-made wall. You see the keep up there. This walled path goes all the way to it. These walls truly embody the art of fortification. The layout is designed in such a way as to eliminate any direct approach to the castle. You're entirely surrounded by these stone walls. So, from the watchtowers and parapets on top of the walls, they could shoot guns and arrows at intruders. So you had to worry about head-on assaults, as well as being shot from the side or from behind. There was no way out of the line of fire. No place was safe. You can kind of feel that it's a maze, can't you? And um, I've always felt that, that these Japanese castle walls look really different from any other castle walls I've ever seen. What is the, the main difference? Japanese castle walls were built from the bottom up by stacking stones. It was simply stacking. If you look at this wall, you can see that the stones are roughly cut to shape, but they're clearly not cut into rectangular blocks. Wall-building artisans built this wall by stacking stone on top of stone, carefully considering the placement one by one. If you look at the stones individually, they seem like a bunch of random shapes. But if you look this way, you can see roughly horizontal lines running across. These are hallmarks of the wall builder's amazing skill. In European castles, the gaps between the stones were filled with mortar to fix them in place. But Japanese castle walls were intentionally made without mortar so that they could slip against each other under strong forces little by little and become even more stable. That's a key feature. Yeah, it's like, despite the randomness of it, there really is a very artistic feel to the, the whole of it. And especially, I mean, if you look at this line here, how it curves out, and it's, it's a perfect curve, isn't it? How did they manage to do that? When they made these stone walls, they calculated the curves very carefully. In wall building, these corners were especially crucial, the positioning of the corner stones. These are all oblong stones, first the end of one stone, the side of the next, and then again the end, followed by the side. They alternate, end and side, end and side, as they're stacked up. In fact, switching the orientation of the stones like this actually makes the wall stronger. The beautiful yet sturdy walls of Kumamoto Castle. They were built by a guild of specialized stonemasons known as the Anoshu. A family of stonemasons in the city of Otsu continues to practice the traditional techniques. Suminori Awata is the 15th in his family line. He searches out the right stones for making walls from heaps of natural rock. Here, Awata is using a skill that has been passed down in his family for generations, hand-packing smaller stones into the cracks between the larger ones. They may appear to be placed haphazardly, but it is these small stones that will support the entire wall from behind. If you botch this job, a wall that should last three or four hundred years will crumble in ten or twenty. 
Building with irregular natural stones is time consuming, but the resulting walls are very durable. Even when a large force is applied, the very irregularity of the stone's shapes and sizes helps dissipate the pressure. This is made possible by the 400-year-old art of stone stacking. The technique is a family secret passed down orally from generation to generation. Awata learned the art of stacking stones from his grandfather, Makizo. Makizo would frequently offer his grandson a special piece of advice. Listen to the stones. Let them tell you where they want to go and place them there. Traditional castle wall building techniques are still used today. In 2004, they helped in the construction of the Shin Nation Expressway. In strength tests conducted before construction, concrete block walls cracked under 200 tons of pressure. But a stone wall built by castle stonemasons was able to withstand 250. Castle walls that have endured for 400 years, crafted by masons who know how to listen to the stone. The Anoshu are still building walls that last. We're getting closer to the main buildings. Almost there. There's a smaller tower over here, though. Can, can you go up here? That is the Uto Watchtower. It was a key part of the castle's defences. Watchtowers were built on some of the corners of the walls in order to repulse attackers and in order to allow an enemy force to be identified even when it was away in the distance. The watchtower has many defensive features built into it. For example, these bars on the windows prevent intruders from climbing through. And you can see there are shutters on the outside of the windows. Now they're propped open, but when they're closed, they blend in with the walls. Okay, okay. And these slit-like windows were used for firing guns or shooting arrows. And this is the corner of the structure, the end wall. Here we have machicolations, a defensive device. Part of the wall projects outward to create a gap. This gap makes it possible to drop stones or hot water. The aim would be to prevent enemies from scaling up the walls. Wow. See how steep the stairs are? Even if attackers get inside the tower, they won't be able to get up to the next level easily. That's why the stairs are so steep. Finally, I think this is the top. Yes, the top floor. Oh, that's really nice. But as I said when we were down there, I don't <laughs> think I want to go all the way up there. That's really high, isn't it? It is. And there's one of these on each side of the tower as well. One important function of watchtowers like these was to have an elevated vantage point where they could spot attacking enemies way off in the distance. These large windows offered expansive views in all directions. I think you can appreciate that very clearly here. It's kind of a nice view out here as well. You can kind of imagine how the feudal lord would have felt kind of looking out over his domains. Mm. Hi, I'm Matt Alt. Today we're talking about castles. More specifically, one that's a lot closer than you might think. In fact, it's right in the middle of downtown Tokyo. This is the Imperial Palace, but it used to be known as Edo Castle. It was built by the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu, but in 1868, it was handed over to the Meiji government forces in a bloodless transition of power as the shogun stepped down. At its peak, it was 2.3 million square meters. That made it bigger than Windsor Palace of England, or even the Palace of Versailles of France. It wasn't just the biggest in Japan, it was the biggest in the world. Currently, it's surrounded by buildings, but back in time, this entire area used to be part of castle grounds. 
there's also a stone wall. And off in the distance, you can see Hanzomon, or Hanzo's Gate, one of many that ring the Imperial Palace grounds. I can almost read your mind. You want to see it up close and personal, right? Well, this is a special place, so you can't just walk in right off the street. But because it's a special place, there's also a special system for touring the Imperial Palace. Our final stop is the top of this building. This building's rooftop is open two hours every afternoon to visitors. And from this really cool vantage point, you can see the entirety of the Edo Castle grounds. Just check out this space. And keep in mind, this is all in the middle of downtown Tokyo. So there you have it. Top secret tips for visiting a castle right in the heart of downtown Tokyo. Next time you're in town, Check it out. So now we've reached the heart of the castle. The keeps were a vital part of the castle, but so was this structure here. This was very important indeed. This looks really new. This building is a painstaking recreation based on archaeological research. It's called the Hommaru Palace. This palace is where affairs of government were carried out. This is also where the Lord lived, ate and slept. So it's the palace and the living quarters. The reconstruction of the Honmaru Palace began in 1999 and took eight years. It made use of floor plans drawn in the 18th century, and traditional carpenters carried out everything from the framing to the interior work using historical methods. The decorations of the palace rooms were done by contemporary craftsmen based on extensive research and study of excavated artifacts. To create the palace's murals, Expert painters with experience in restoring wall murals classed as national treasures of Japan made countless sketches before creating the final artwork. It took them four years. The Honmaru Palace was recreated down to the smallest detail by master artisans. The pride and joy of Kato Kiyomasa now stands once again. This is probably the largest room I've ever been in, in Japan, and especially with tatami mats. This space alone is more than 100 tatami mats. It's an extremely large room. And 400 years ago, who would have been allowed to walk in a room like this? This is where the feudal lord would hold formal audiences with his retainers. Only a select few among the elite samurai would be permitted into this room. And here we come to the end. Wow, look at this. Ooh, we're going a rank or two up now, aren't we? Wow. And this is presumably an even more special space. Yes, very special indeed. Oh. And oh my God, look at this. Are we even allowed to go in here? <laughs> I kind of feel loath to step across here. Notice the part of the floor is raised by a step. The area up above is where the feudal lord sat in this room encircled by these sumptuous painted walls and screens. Up above, we have a raised ceiling that is coffered and lavishly decorated. If you look, you'll see all the coffers are exquisitely painted. Wow. It was the finest, the most formally decorated room of the time. That is absolutely amazing. It's a little surprising, though, that that picture on the end there looks very Chinese, and the rest of this is incredibly Japanese. In those days, within the body of knowledge shared by the samurai, what they knew of the world, 
All things Chinese were the best. Chinese culture was at the top. That was the traditional value and their way of thinking. And that world view, that way of thinking, comes across very strongly in these paintings. And of course, this is hidden away at an angle. So all the people out there in that big room out there, and even that is amazing. But they won't see the feudal lord in here, and they won't be probably even able to imagine what this looks like. So it's kind of interesting too, isn't it? That actually shows a significant difference between how European rulers exhibited their authority and how Japanese feudal lords and samurai did. So, in this ornately decorated space, with its floor a step higher, the feudal lord would sit and hold formal audiences. But in fact, most of the samurai couldn't even see the room. The most powerful people exhibited their power by concealing it. That philosophy certainly sets the Japanese rulers apart from the European ones. It's a whole different mentality, isn't it? That's, that's really quite fascinating. Ah. I was thinking in Europe, you don't really see castles, or if you do, they tend to be just remains. What you do see a lot of is churches. Uh, uh, either cathedrals or slightly smaller churches, perhaps, and a lot of them go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think perhaps people in Europe have the same sort of feelings toward churches that the Japanese do towards castles. It, it's a bit of a different society, I suppose, but um, rather interesting, I find, anyway. I think the difference reflects the unique characteristics of Japanese history. Before the 17th century, there was an age of conflict between samurai and religious power centers such as Buddhist temples, and the samurai achieved overwhelming victory. So in the centers of cities you had the castles, and the temples were relegated to the fringes from the 17th century onwards. That is why typical Japanese cities are centered on and symbolized by castles, and not by religious buildings. And still today, a castle tends to have that symbolic significance. A castle in a given area is what comes to mind when people think of that area. Wow, I've learned so much today. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Next time, bathhouses. Some of the most famous ones look like temples or shrines. The bathhouse experience is designed to bring you a taste of paradise on Earth. <laughs>